there was um, an experience where I think it was like a D-Day or something like that and the history teacher put that on and was like I have taught about this for years and I've seen videos and I've read about it you know interacted with students but to be in that and to feel what that's like and you're like jumping out of a helicopter and you see you know your dog tags are flying around and the planes and everything was like unbelievable so it doesn't seem like it's going away anytime soon for us as educators like we need to know about it because it's our world we're living in but we also need to know about it because we have to prepare our students because it's the world that they're going to be living in and designing too as they move forward <laughs> You actually had to basically run over here because you told me the other day that you had something like 22 engagements yeah, in a day, like today. Yeah, there's a lot. And, you know, thanks, first of all, thanks for having me. Of course. But I, I had my roller skates on on the way. I should have, like, be an 80s kid with skates. But it's, it's awesome. It's very busy. But a lot of those things are just, you know, meet and greets or things in the expo or sitting in on a roundtable discussion and some more presentations that I'm doing. So it's, it's a lot. So I just look at my calendar. I'm like, yep, that's still Tuesday. But that's, for me, that's what ISTE has been about, just being on the move. Because, like, the more that you're on the move, you get to run into other people and learn things, like, all along the way. Like, you can't walk from one point to the other without, like, stopping and seeing somebody that you may have never met in person. So that's what I love about ISTE. So you're a featured speaker here this year at ISTE in New Orleans. I'm curious, what kind of overall message are you hoping to communicate to educators through your myriad <laughs> presentations? I see lots of stuff here, a lot of stuff about uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. Is that kind of the direction? Yeah, there's um, a lot of different things. You know, I've always loved technology. And I think the first is that I went to, well, the first one that I went to was in 2015 in Philly. And I had a poster session. And I remember that, you know, I had the board and I had all these different things. Like I was using my classroom as a language teacher. I started to bring in different tools because like the students we were doing activities and worksheets and all of those typical things. And I was just amazed at all the different ways students could learn and practice. And because it was fun for me to kind of try these things out, like I didn't have that obviously when I went to school, but um, what I was using in my classroom to help students learn, I was teaching the way I've been taught, which without the tech, didn't have that. And the students weren't getting it like I thought they should, and they weren't engaged like I was hoping that they would be. So when I first came to ISTE, I was just sharing like, hey, we're using these game-based learning tools and assessment tools and presentation tools, like you name it, and was excited to share those things because I saw the impact on my students and myself, and I wanted to make it easier for other teachers. And so then over the past, this is now you know how many ISTEs I've been to, the topics that I talk about have changed. Uh, there are still some that are very similar because I do a lot of the same things. But for years, prior to being a STEAM teacher, I was just teaching Spanish and French. And so I was asked to teach a course in STEAM when we got a grant for a makerspace, so A being the arts. And uh, I was asking, what do you want to teach about? And I was into like augmented reality, virtual reality. But for years, like many teachers, I said, I'm just a Spanish teacher. I can't do that. You know, I don't, I can't bring in AR, VR, talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, but then one of my students said, why aren't we doing the cool AR, VR stuff? And I didn't have an answer. And so that's when I started to do those things. So over the last probably five years in presentations, it's, there's like a spectrum of like SEL focus, um, STEM focus, AR, VR, because that's where, I mean, there's so much in the world, all these emerging technology, you know, metaverse, NFTs, you name it. And we need to know about it to prepare our students. And I think pushing teachers, you know, it's hard because there's so much going on right now, but whenever I, or anybody for that matter, you know, you're coming to a conference to present, if I can do the groundwork for you and just share the ideas and the links so you can get started and know that you don't have to be an expert because that's what I thought for a long time, then that's what I'm all about. I'm all about running around all over the place if I can make it easier for somebody else and for their students. I've heard you talk in the past about Nearpod, that Nearpod was kind of an entry point for you with, yeah. with using uh, virtual reality with the 360 degree images to be able right. to transport students essentially to a place that they're studying in your Spanish class. Yeah. Is there, are there tools, I'm, I'm assuming, Nearpod is still great, we, we love it Nearpod, is. I'm assuming you also have kind of expanded your repertoire of <laughs> tools that you're using to bring VR and AR into your Spanish classroom. What are some of those tools that you're really excited about and also just like enlighten us about what the technology can do these days and how you see virtual reality working in in a regular classroom. Yeah, so you know, I just did a, a session yesterday, a 90-minute workshop was on AI, AR, VR, 
And I talked about Nearpod being the first, you know, basically with the VR in my Spanish classes because that was a way to take them all around the world. And there's that wow factor of it because it's like, okay, that's nice to look at that, but what can you learn from that? And talking about things like that, you know, social emotional learning and, and developing these under, this understanding of like what it's like to live in different places and to have the students hold that in their hands. And so for anybody you know, who's thinking about like, oh, I don't know where to start with VR, Nearpod's great because there's all those other components of it, but you can find something that's ready to go. Beyond that, you know, you want students to be the creators as well. And depending on what your access is to devices and the tools and of course the age uh, of, of your students, but CoSpace is a great tool because it has a collaborative feature so you can put students into groups. Uh, it's great, you're talking about ISI standards like digital citizenship, creative communicators, um, innovative designers, like all of these things that you want the students to develop these skills. That one's great because students who, I've had students for years who said, well, I don't want to have to do this, you know, it's too hard, or I don't understand, like even the ones that are afraid to try it, it's okay to like dive in with them because they can navigate it and they learn so fast. I mean, beyond I, the first project I did, it took forever, and then these students are like cranking them out like nothing, and there's so much there. So I always recommend, you know, starting with something where you can go, there's a library, CoSpaces is great, um, the Nearpod I already said, Merge Cube. You know, if I would have had a Merge Cube when mm -hmm. I took geometry, I would have totally done better in <laughs> geometry. I would know where all the planets were in the solar system because you're holding that and that connection that students have. Uh, so for creating, you know, students can take co-spaces and create it on a merge queue. And there's a lot of other apps on your phone, even when it comes to, you know, web-based. Like we've done Zoom and Microsoft Teams and all those meetings, but there are like Mozilla hubs. And you can create like a gallery, an office space, a library space where you actually have a virtual classroom, or a student could design an art gallery where they have like their works of art that they've uploaded into that. And it's just, the technology, there's so many things like that. I could sit here and talk to you about it for like three hours, but I know we don't have that much time. But I did share you know, a lot of resources. Um, there's one that's called Thing, T-H-Y-N-G. For anybody that ever used HP Reveal or Arasma, it's like a trigger image. It's just a lot of fun that you can create you know, the augmented reality and see like, hey, here, here we are sitting here talking, but there's a big dinosaur over there or something. And to have students understand that and create with it, it's, it's just a lot of fun. So a merge cube for those who are listening or watching yeah. <laughs> who are not familiar is essentially a three-dimensional object that you can map artificial, uh, um, or um, what am I trying to say? Yeah. Um, Aug <laughs> augmented I, reality, right, right. not artificial reality. Augmented reality using usually through, through a world-facing camera on something like an iPad. Mm -hmm. Virtual reality also obviously necessitates having some kind of headset. I'm curious, is that, do you think that should be a part of classrooms today, you know, we, we've kind of made this push to one-to-one -one computers. Right. It seems like there are other devices. Now, of course, you can flip a laptop around and make it into a world-facing camera, but some kind of tablet device is, at least my understanding, ideal to be able to actually do any kind of augmented reality. And then, of course, virtual reality requires some kind of a headset. And now Google Cardboard, not really a thing right. anymore. So, um, and, and even the kind of pop-in headsets where you stick a phone into it, those are sort of less than ideal. Yeah. So if you could sort of, if you had a wish list right. and you were kind of recommending to a school that really wants to push in innovation, mm -hmm. what do you think schools need to be providing students in order to give them these kind of fully immersive experiences? Yeah, and it's a scary thing too to think about because like I have four Oculus Go headsets that <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing I could do with them now because they went, went away and technology changes. And so I do now have a quest and enjoy playing some Beat Saber. Uh, that's I have like, one too. It's like my exercise now. I'm like, I don't need to go to the gym. I have the Beat Saber. But I think, you know, because things tend to change a lot, you're, there's no guarantees. Diving in and investing a lot in one thing specifically when you don't know for sure that's going to be, you know, you hope that it's going to stay around forever, but like the ones I mentioned, you know, some of those apps, people love those apps and then they were gone and other things come along. So I think if you can have access to, you know, a set of class iPads or even a few of them or a Chromebook for students, and if you don't have a lot, like, so students can work in stations and you can try some different resources to see what works for you, what works for your students, and, you know, go into it like, slowly, but I think when you have, you know, you mentioned the Google Cardboard, you know, we had some of those. We had the ones that, like the Viewmaster years ago. The Merge headsets were great because they're foam and you know, you can clean those off. Cardboard can't clean off so much. But uh, you know, if you have access to the Quest or anything like that to give students that chance to really experience it, 
But even with the VR, you know, using those web-based spaces like Mozilla Hub, so you can do things that you have the headset, but the idea behind those is to have just you know, the web-based experience so you can still feel connected in that. And for schools, looking at things where you know, the students can collaborate, like co-spaces, because you can put them in groups, they're connecting with maybe a, a class from a different part of the world, and then now you're tying in the SEL, SC, SC standards are tied in there, you know, digital citizenship, because they're, they're working in that same space. But um, it, they're also building skills that are essential for, I mean, not just the future, but for now, because they're creating and problem solving and all of those things that we need here today, and apparently by the year 2025, when you know 58 million jobs in STEM and and all of these skills that the, the workers will need in the future, and we need. I'd love to keep talking with you about <laughs> this virtual reality stuff. Actually, yeah. if you're okay with yeah, it, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so you mentioned the Quest, and I, so the Quest is not connected; it's not wired, right. whereas older virtual reality yeah, headsets like required you to have a desktop and it was totally impractical to right. have lots of those. The Quest is not wired and it has the handheld devices, so it, it is this much more fully immersive experience where you can actually touch things and you're wearing clothing and things <laughs> like that. It's pretty incredible yeah. <laughs> if people haven't checked it out. My understanding, the last I checked, and, and I haven't looked now for, for a couple of years, to be honest, um, really closely, was just that the software hadn't quite met with the hardware in terms of there being a lot of educational software. Yeah. You know, there was Google Expeditions that obviously is no longer, and now it's kind of, yeah, you can go to Google Arts and Culture to, to get that sort of educational content. Merge obviously has a whole archive of educational content. Are you excited about any particular apps that are, um, or software that you can use with something like an Oculus mm -hmm that is educational, or do you see it more as a potential that that could be something that we make use of in the future? Yeah, well that's a great question, and a very timely one too, because there, and, and I'm still in the process of, you know, there's never enough time, and the first thing that I put on it was the Beat Saber, and I just was so, like, wow, this is the best thing ever, you know? And then I, I put a boxing app on, and I'm like, oh, you know, physical activity, so, you know, physical education classes, like why not, right? You want them to do something that's kind of active. You could have the Beat Saber <laughs> dance challenges. But uh, on tomorrow, it uh, we're have, there's an AR VR playground and there's going to be a lot of Oculus headsets and there are a lot of apps that we're going to be showing. And I want to do spoiler alerts, but uh, you can't, and the idea is to have educators come by and see that there are some, there's like an Anne Frank one, uh, there's a whole list of them, and of course I'm blanking on a bunch of them now, but there are a lot of them out there. There are starting to become more of them. Initially there weren't, and so whenever you would use, like even the Oculus Go headset, there were things that you could do that you could find that would give students experiences like, oh, this is what it's like if you're in like a helicopter and you have to jump out. There was um, an experience where, I think it was like a D-Day or something like that, and the history teacher put that on and was like, I have taught about this for years, and I've seen videos and I've read about it, you know, interacted with students, but to be in that and to feel what that's like, and you're like jumping out of a helicopter and you see, you know, your dog tags are flying around and the planes and everything was like unbelievable. And so having those same experiences where you can go and you feel like you're sitting in that place or you can be surrounded by it and understand it better, it's really interesting. Now for some people it does cause motion sickness, so there are those aspects of it, but the potential with, I mean, just VR in general is that like with older adults, with younger children, anybody, there's a lot of ways that they're being, it's being used to help people understand and experience things. It could be a dangerous environment, it could be a scary environment. And you know, with the Quest, like I said, I'm newer to that part of it because I was still thinking about what am I going to do with these four Oculus Go's. But for anybody who's listening to come by tomorrow for the four hours and we have, I forget how many of the headsets and we have like the masks to put on and there's all of these different stations of things to do and it would be a great place to come in to see what the potential is. And there's going to be a lot of us there doing you know, side presentations and everything. And Jamie Donnelly, who is absolutely amazing um, and does presentations and has books. I mean, she is the, the go-to for any questions like that. I mean, I will always say I'm not an expert. And if you ask me a question, I'll be if I don't know, I'll get Jamie. But uh, yeah, there's it's just amazing. Of, of every day, there's news that comes out about how it's being used and for you know lab experiments and simulations or what's it like to operate on somebody. And you have you know the gloves. Like there's a company, Sensory X, and they have these you know the, the haptic gloves. I think is what they were. And you're like doing the experiment, and then or bomb 
you know, figuring out like how could you de detonate? No, not detonate. <laughs> you yeah, don't want to detonate. Not de put it, uh, yeah, defuse. <laughs> yes, that's, wow. <laughs> Let's go back and rewind. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but those types of things where like you want somebody to kind of interact and see like how could you do this without the harm potential but you would have the impact of it because like maybe you are like trying to sew something together and like it falls apart or like the, the bomb thing and an or a chemistry experiment and like the thing sets on fire and like you see that, but you're not being harmed by that and then have a conversation about it or to put them into some environment where, you know, like for me as a Spanish teacher, picking three very different places and dropping kids into those and like look around, what do you see? And that helps them to build, you know, social emotional learning skills and like, wow, like the social awareness and empathy. There are a lot of benefits. And for a long time, I think people thought of it as like, oh, it's a fad, it's gonna pass and all of that, but you know, it's not. People are meeting in VR, companies are having you know, businesses and offices, and you got the metaverse where people have land and businesses and selling things, and so it doesn't seem like it's going away anytime soon. And uh, so, that for us as educators, like we need to know about it because it's our world we're living in. But we also need to know about it because we can prepare our students because it's the world that they're going to be living in and designing too as they move forward. So I think it's exciting. It's scary, but um, it's also exciting. And what better place to learn about things like this than being at ISTE and in person, and if you're not at ISTE, then catching up on all of the uh, hashtags and the, the resources that are online and connecting with me or Jamie. So if a person wants to get started with virtual reality, augmented reality in their classroom, they're watching this and they're like, this sounds intriguing, yeah. what would you recommend they do? I would say, based on time and all of that, I would, I would go to Nearpod first, just to try out, because you don't have to worry about creating anything, it's already there. You can add activities in, well, you know, with the lessons, and then just pick some of their VR trips. There are some beautiful, like Santorini Greece comes up all the time, it is mm -hmm. awesome. But figure out a way to connect that to your class and have a conversation and see where that goes. And then maybe go into one like, say, co spaces where kids can create, or the merge cube when they can look at, you know, a volcano or dissect a frog, for example, because those two integrate as well because you can create the code spaces on the merge queue. Uh, looking at some other, the web base like Mozilla Hubs, there's one, uh, Cena VR, there's Frame VR, there's a lot, there's Spatial XR, which is, it takes your webcam and it takes your selfie and then it creates an avatar that mimics your interaction. So I showed it yesterday and like David Lockett was in my session. I was like, look David, do you remember when we did this? In the, in the chat was Scott Noons, David Lockett, Jamie was leading it of course, and myself. And it has like the top part of the body, which is, you know, not really you, but then it has a face that's almost identical to your face. And as you're talking, it's mimicking your mouth, your eyes and everything. And you can see each other. We were like, whoa. But you can put pictures on the wall, like it's your home, your office, your school, whatever the space is, and it's just, it doesn't take a lot of time to get started. And some teachers use those to create like a library space for their students. Granted, you have to check like the age and so forth, but what you would put into it, it's really neat. But, you know, just kind of level up. Just start with one thing and then try it. And if you like it and the students like it, then you keep going. And if you don't, like there's plenty more where they came from. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on our yeah. live stream today. I definitely need to go check out the AR VR playground yes, and tomorrow. learn more about all these different apps. And I agree with you that this is definitely the future of education, if not fully in the metaverse, that it is going to be a more integral part because it's experience-based learning. It just it seems like the natural progression of where things are going. It was wonderful chatting with yeah, you. you. We too. didn't get to talk about the theme of you know being, being a connected, connected. educator. Yeah. It, but we're here at ISTE and we're connecting and people are absolutely. watching and you know I, I just saw somebody on the way here and I was like, I'm so sorry I can't stand and, and talk to you right now, but <laughs> but just getting around and, and we are connecting and we're sharing ideas with other educators, so absolutely. thank you. Definitely, so if somebody wants to find your work, find your books, find, and you do <laughs> podcast, blog, everything. Yeah, I have a podcast where, where, where I talk where to myself. Where should they go? <laughs> <laughs> just, most of the time. It's, um, uh, everything's pretty consistent. So it's R-D-E-N-E-915 -E -E because it's first initial, middle name, Danae, and my birthday because that goes back to the AOL emails and yeah, but it's rdanae915, Instagram, Twitter, Gmail, my website, my blog, my podcast, you name it, you'll find it. And I'm, I don't have all the answers, but if I can help somebody, I would love to. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Rochelle Danae Poth, for coming on. And have a wonderful rest of your time here in New Orleans at ISTE. You too.
Thank <laughs> you.